Hey there, uh, my name is Vosh. I'm a political live streamer and YouTuber, and uh, I am also a socialist. I mention that primarily because I believe that it's really important to understand any biases that go into the media that you consume. There's always a bias, there's always an edge, you know? And I'm a socialist, that informs my politics and my perspectives. But I think that what I have to say is applicable and agreeable no matter what your political perspective is. I mean, even if you really, really disagree with me. So I get a lot of questions about what it is that I believe and broadly like how to engage with politics. I mean, politics is important. People care about it a lot. A lot of money and time goes into the study and exercise of political power. Um, and sometimes the questions that people ask me are so broad, so fundamental that it's almost impossible for me to give a direct answer. I mean, sometimes people ask me stuff where I, I feel like Sometimes I don't even know the answer directly. It's so simple that it's unintuitive. A while ago, like two years ago, I made a video called Politics 101 with Professor Vosh. That's a lie right there. I'm not actually a professor, but you know, it's an explanatory video. It's two and a half hours long. I look like crap, old webcam. The site looks like crap, old site. I mean, all of it's just a, it's just a mess, but a lot of people like this video because I broke down my approach to politics, not just why I care about it, but you know, how I approach it. Why? Because people ask me, like, how do you get your political views? And man, that's a really complicated question, you know? I want to revise that video. That's what this is. Hopefully it'll be a little more concise and a little bit more informative. So let's get started. This video, like the last one, will be unscripted. I have a couple of bullet points next to me, but apart from that, this really is all off the cuff. So we'll see how comprehensive I can get. Now, the real heart of this question is, what are politics? And why are they important? I mean, really, like, what is politics? I mean, what does that even mean? Really, it's obviously important. People obviously care enough about it to kill or to be killed. Um, it's the center point of, like, modern discourse, really. I mean, anybody who pays attention to modern media these days has to acknowledge the fact that political discourse is, like, central to many people's lives. But why? I mean, why do we participate in it all? Um, I mean, I like politics and I participate in politics because I think a study of politics is essential to understanding the world and changing the world in some manner or another. I think that's critical. Um, there are many parts of our world, elements of them, systemic or individual, that suck, you know? Like, some things really suck, um, whether these be individual problems, like a, a person being abusive or, 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 like, sexist in a relationship, or whether they be broad and systemic, like, you know, poverty or hunger. There are reasons why these things happen. Nothing is natural, really. I mean, we built this world. We conquered this planet as much as any other entity ever has before, and we have control over a lot of these problems. So... When I focus on politics, I mean, when I think what I want to do, I want to, more than anything else, increase the amount of good in the world. That's really vague, right? Increasing good in the world. I mean, it's, it's almost insultingly arbitrary, you know? Um, but actually, I think that if you ask most people, most people, I mean, you know, whether they agree with me or not on the socialism thing, you'd find that they, they also want to increase the good in the world. That also seems to be the thing they care about mostly. Like, that seems to be the, the thrust of the issue. But people disagree wildly on what is or isn't good, or how to do good, or what good should be done, or what good should be ignored and left for others to do. And it's actually really astonishing when you think about it, because we live in a world where almost everyone agrees that you should engage with politics to the end of making life better for people. And then we all end up arguing and disagreeing anyway. Why? Well, let me bust out the paint stream. To get to that, to discuss something as fundamental as why do people disagree, unfortunately, and I really do mean unfortunately, we have to talk just a little bit about philosophy. I mean, just a little bit, okay? Now, please keep in mind, I beg of you, I beg of you more than anything else, okay? If there's anything that you're to take from this, more so than anything I have to say directly, it's, it's this, okay? Every subject that I touch on, every topic, every pointer, all of it, 
they are all being simplified for the sake of this video, this stream. There is absolutely no way to comprehensively cover everything that I am to discuss here. It is not possible. It cannot be done. Uh, so instead, I'm going to touch on these points, and I'm going to encourage you, if you find something interesting, to think about it a little bit more and maybe do some research into it. And I'll talk about that shortly as well. So in order for us to understand the very, very, very basics of philosophy, we need to understand the difference between two types of claims. They're called normative claims and descriptive claims, okay? Now, a descriptive claim, which I'll represent with a, with a large D, see, look, I've even bolded it there. See, it's like, a, like word art, like clip art, you know? A descriptive claim is a claim about the world which is empirical. It's measurable, it's substantive. I could say, for example, that upon this hand, I have five fingers. Now, if you want to, you can be infinitely reductive here. What exactly is a finger? Is a thumb a finger? Where does the finger begin or end? How do you determine what is or is not a hand? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But five fingers. <laughs> we I think we could agree on that for the most part, leaving aside the, you know, uh the philosophical meanderings, okay? But then you have normative claims, okay? Normative claims are moral statements. They're statements about the world, but they're statements which infer or directly state some kind of moral belief. So I'm going to give you two claims that sound very, very similar, and I want you to distinguish between them which one is normative and which one is moral, okay? Here's claim one. Uh, now, this isn't necessarily true, but for simplicity's sake. Most women are housekeepers. That's a claim that one could make. And then here's another claim. Women should be housekeepers. Do you see the difference between those two claims? One thing that people like to do, whether intentionally or otherwise, is to mix up claims that are descriptive and claims that are normative. The first claim, which is descriptive, and let's assume that it's true, it might not be, I, it, that's not the point here, the, but if it were true, it's a descriptive claim. You can measure it. It's, there's a yes or a no answer to that, whether or not most women are housekeepers. But the second claim, the normative claim, with which I will not represent with a large N, um, the normative claim is about what the world ought be. The, the, the distinction essentially is, is ought. And this is a concern in the philosophical world and academia, and it has been for a very long time. It's called the is ought gap. How do you arrive at what the world should be when all you know is what the world is? That's the is ought gap right there. And it's basically been the, you know, the center of philosophical discourse for as long as we've had philosophical discourse. Because all we know is what the world is, really. How do we arrive at what the world should be from that? Well, there are many ways to do that, actually. You see, <laughs> there's something called an axiom, okay? An axiom, or a first principle, or a properly basic belief, there are a lot of terms that mean very similar things. It fundamentally refers to a core value that you hold. Okay, I'm going to draw a little axiom right here. And I mean, when I say core value, I mean the most, oh, it looks kind of like a little anarchy symbol, doesn't it? Here, I don't want that necessarily. Here, I'll make it a little, see, there we go. Still cute. See, I like the anarchy too, but we're, we'll try to keep our concepts distinct here. Make it a dragon ball. You know what? Yeah, let's do that. Here, hold on. A little, little mouse stars. Eh, yeah. There, it's, it's a dragon ball. There we go. Think of that as, a, as an axiom. See, there's the three star one. Um, an axiom is a fundamental moral belief about the world. Um, so I'll give you a really simple one. It's one that I believe in. And to describe it in its entirety would take a lot of qualifying and a lot of explaining. But simply, I believe that the well-being of living things should be maximized. That is to say, I think that if you're conscious... Because I like animals too, you know. If you're conscious, if you can think, if you're engaging with the world, that life should be made good for you. We have finite lifespans. Uh, I personally prefer being happy to being unhappy. Just a personal opinion of mine. 
Seems other people feel the same way. Hell, even animals seem to feel the same way. We all seem to be pretty much united in our preference for happiness over unhappiness. So, since that seems nice, I have an axiomatic preference for the well-being of living things. Now, how do I know that's worth pursuing? Well, this is where we get to moral realism, and this gets more complicated than I can really delve into, but philosophers have differing ideas on the extent to which you can prove that an axiom is correct. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to go into that, and I don't want to dally too much in the philosophy stuff, because of all the subjects we're going to discuss, this is the one that I have the there's the greatest distance between how much respect I have for it and how much I know about it. A lot of respect, but it's very complicated. <laughs> Maybe we can expand upon that in the future. So I personally, I think that axioms are more of a personal preference thing, but, you know, there's a lot of variance there. What matters most is that humans seem to basically have the same axioms, at least broadly. I mean, talk to people, you know? What is it they value? For the most part, it's gonna be well-being. Now, a lot of them, a lot of people, don't really have a coherent or really rigorous understanding of their own philosophical thoughts, you know? They don't really have a full understanding of why they value certain moral things over certain other moral things. But if you talk to most people, like, hey, why do you think child poverty is bad? Well, makes them unhappy. That's not fair, you know? Well, why should it be fair? Why ought they be happy? Well, maybe because they, you know, also value human happiness. The distinctions tend to come in when we argue over how to best maximize human happiness. And that's really the key point right there. If you talk with people with different politi uh, political values, like, say, between me and a Republican, you'll find that people, even if they believe human well-being should be maximized, have incredibly different beliefs about, like, what it takes to make things or people happy. There are, like, even within the simplest possible constructs, it's, like, think about it. Think about poverty, for example. Most people would agree that poverty makes people unhappy, you know, and most people would agree that it should be minimized. But if you talk to a socialist or a social democrat, they'll describe poverty as a systemic issue, and you can fix it through systemic solutions. If you talk to most conservatives, they'll describe it as an individual issue that can be solved with individual solutions, usually hard work or a really strong work ethic. So even if you agree that there's a problem, how to solve that problem is still a matter of consequence. What you need to do is you need to find out how to draw the line from a thing that you support all the way back to the axiomatic belief that it connects to. So I'll give you an example of that really, really easily, okay? Let's talk about uh, trans people, which we never do on this channel. You know, a little bit of a departure from the norm, okay? Let's talk about um, trans healthcare, trans affirming healthcare, okay? So here's a position that I have, okay? And I'm gonna walk you through it step by step. I believe that uh, 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 trans healthcare should be um, covered by Medicare and Medicaid. I think that it should be covered. It shouldn't be considered a cosmetic treatment, that it should be considered core medical care. That's a belief that I have. So I'll represent that belief with a little star right here. So somebody might ask me why, and then the answer that I would give to that, to that why, is because the medical research seems to indicate that uh, trans people's relationships to medicine pertaining to their transness is something severe. It's something that relates very, very directly to their well-being. It's not just cosmetic. It's not just to make them feel better. This is every bit as essential to them as, you know, well, essential medical care that's not related to my gender identity would be to me. And then they could say, okay, fine, maybe, but why? And then I would say, because I believe that society giving special provisions to people who have necessary medical uh, treatments benefits society. I think that we're better off, that society is better off when we're willing to give a little bit more leeway, whether that be financial support or whatever else, to people who need essential medical care. And then they would say, oh, well, why? And then I would say, because the access to essential medical care when needed is a core component in human happiness. And then they would say, okay, fine, sure. So why is that important? And then I would tie it back to the axiom, because I think human well-being should be maximized. Does that make sense?
I'm often frustrated when I talk to people who I disagree with because it seems like there's a disconnect between the things that they claim they believe and the things that they actually advocate for. And this is the number one best way to make sure that the things you're advocating for directly lead from your beliefs, from your first principles. It's a way of making sure you're being consistent. And that consistency is really, really important because if a person has a disconnect between what they support and what they claim to care about, it can be really difficult to get over to them. This is what I feel like I'm doing most often when I talk with more moderate conservatives. You know, a lot of moderate conservatives are totally cool with like a $15 an hour minimum wage or higher unionization. They care about these things. They care about poverty. They care about, you know, um, decreasing austerity. There's like a lot to agree with them on, but then they vote Republican. Okay, well, why did you do that then? And usually if you talk with them for a bit, there's some wedge issue, some set of beliefs or often misconceptions that led them to do so. And when you talk with them, you realize this person isn't acting in their own self-interest. This is where the concept of class consciousness comes from. It's a Marxian concept. It's the idea that in a good society, a society which is just and fair and equitable, workers, the working class, so people who don't own businesses, essentially, you know, most people, um, that the working class would have class consciousness, or they would be familiar with their class relationship to the world. That is to say, they would learn to act and think in their own self-interest. And that is a lot of what I feel like I'm fighting for here. There are a lot of four poor people in this country who fight against stuff that would take them out of poverty. There are a lot of uh, people who suffer from discrimination who will fight against ideas designed to emancipate them. Now, there's one other thing that I want to touch on here before I move on to a more specific uh, political pointer, and that's consequentialism. So there are a lot of roads by which you can assess the morality of an action. Um, the two most commonly invoked are uh, deontology and consequentialism. A deontologist, and if you really want to read Kant, you can, but God. A deontologist, put really simply, believes that the moral worth of an action is determined by the action in and of itself. Um, that, for example, lying is wrong. Or that, um, you know, that stealing is wrong, you know, just like flat, flat out, like, like bar none, you know, like that's, that's that, that's done right there. And of course it gets more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. Whereas a consequentialist is of the opinion that it is only the consequences of an actions that are wrong. That is to say, stealing is often wrong because the consequences of stealing often lead to an immoral redistribution of resources. But if you're, I don't know, stealing uh, uh, guns from someone who you know is going to put out a hit on somebody else or something like that, then I don't know, may maybe that would be a moral act of theft because you're depriving them of the resources that they would need to commit some other heinous moral crime. Or maybe lying can be justifiable sometimes if the lying has a good outcome. Now, most of the time, lying is probably not a great thing to do, not a good foundation of trust for your relationships. And I personally place a very high value on honesty, but sometimes, uh, well, the old example, and this is the example most often used, I think, in relation to this question is, what if you're a sympathetic German citizen during the Third Reich, and you have kept, you know, a, a Jewish neighbors in your house, and, you know, the SS asks you, are you keeping anyone with you? Now, if you tell the truth and say yes, you will die, and then they will die. Your family will die. <laughs> and maybe your neighbors will die too. They're just the ones who weren't even involved. Who knows? You know, they were, uh, they were pretty trigger happy back then. Uh, whereas, of course, if you lie, then potentially all those lives could be saved. Now, Again, I speak to my biases. I'm a consequentialist, and that informs my beliefs. Uh, uh, I'm not a deontologist, so maybe I've made my position seem a little bit more sympathetic than the other. But, you know, we all have our biases. You should look that stuff up. The What is it? The Stanford uh, Plato Dictionary is uh, a wonderful resource for familiarizing yourself with philosophical subjects. 
Um, it's, you know, very, very good to look into. And the more you think about your political positions, the more helpful it'll be to understand how to effectively and consistently apply them. The more and the better you can do that, the better off you're going to be. That's very, very, very important. So I can talk about the, the theoreticals here forever. You know, I could ramble forever about this. But in reality, eventually you have to start talking about the real world. And I think it's time we finally moved on to that. Does anyone here in chat happen to know about a little thing called the Enlightenment? Are you familiar with this little, this, this thing, this meme, as it's known, uh, historically? I'm happy to hear that some people are indeed familiar with the meme known as the Enlightenment. So, for our purposes here, and I am being very, very reductive, human history, prior to a point I'm going to describe a couple hundred years ago, was a large miasma of societies, civilizations, heroes and villains, conquerors and uh, democrats, leaders and followers, uh, and their beliefs varied tremendously. There were periods of time, historical civilizations from this miasma, which had radically different views to others. Um, I'm not to say that they're all exactly the same, uh, only that for our purposes, I want to speak of a general trend that was present in the world during that time period, okay? Again, we're being very reductive here. And that belief was one of hierarchy. See, no matter what part of the world you're in during that time period, the predominant understanding of the human condition was that some people are born or fit or ordained to lead, and most people aren't. Now, there were many theories justifying this. There were religious and caste systems which explained that humans, through birthright or through trial or through conquest, determined whether or not they were worthy to be part of a higher or lower political station. There were... The, the divine right of kings was a really common idea. The idea that the monarchy, the, these, this wasn't just a royal family. God chose these people. Their blood was divine. And so their rule over the people, it wasn't just some political, you know, convenience. It was a direct expression of the will of God. You also have that with theocracies, of course. And, you know, we all know the Catholic Church and their, you know, right to rule in Europe for the great many years. Um, you had emperors and empresses, kings and queens. If you go back far enough even, even back to pre-civilization times, you know, you, you had tribal chieftains, and very often they had their own justifications for why some people were sicker and less cringe than other people. Usually the general attitude, and again, this is all very generalized, okay? There were some societies, even back a year while ago, way before the Enlightenment, that were pseudo-democratic, and there were civilizations far, far kinder to their lower classes than others. But, never really hit the mark, in my personal opinion. Now, it wasn't just about the divinity or the supremacy of the people who ruled. There was also this attitude that the average person was just not really fit to have that much control over their own lives. You know, back in the days of the, the European feudal uh, kingdoms, it wasn't just that the kings and queens were divinely chosen. It's that the peasantry were ignorant and stupid and uh, uh, degenerate, essentially, and small-minded and that they weren't really capable of managing their own lives, you know? They were essentially cattle to be moved around by the real players. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, actually. Game of Thrones actually satirizes this exact idea, and this was a common idea back at the time. Um, the Game of Thrones, especially back when it was good, before season five, a lot of it was kind of about how all of Westeros had had maybe a couple dozen people moving the chess pieces and the, the everyone else was just sort of fodder to die in warfare or to be you know to to be used to raise uh weaponry or cattle or food you know what i mean but but for the most part the only people making real decisions is small you know a proportion a very small number of 
what would you call them, Westerosians of Westeros's people were actually making these decisions. And to an extent, that's kind of how it went down. Most people, most peasants, most serfs just were not given that much control over their lives. But, but, uh, then we had a little something called the Enlightenment. Now, before the Enlightenment, the predominant intellectual trend uh, in, in the political sphere, in, in, you know, medieval Europe, was that the peasantry needed to be controlled by their superiors for their own sake, that this was just, it was just a necessity. Mor morality didn't even really play into it, frankly. It wasn't even about what was right or wrong. It's just the peasantry couldn't manage their own affairs. And to an extent, unfortunately, that's kind of true. They couldn't read or write, most of them. And unfortunately, being able to read or write is pretty essential to being able to meaningfully control your own life. Without being able to read or write, you can't really participate in long-distance communication without an interpreter or translator. You can't read the word of God, which precludes you from being a member of the um, of the priest class. You can't really settle debts or manage ledgers that well, which makes it difficult for you to participate in, you know, the mercantile system. It really kind of precluded you from any meaningful political engagement, which is unfortunate. I mean, you could be a soldier, you know, there's that, and there were some illiterate soldiers who rose up and maintained some decent station, but that's really more of an exception. Um, usually soldiers did not do much other than die for their kings and queens. But, you know, some real bright folks got together and they thought, what if all this, uh, what if all this not democracy shit is actually incredibly cringe, you know? What if this is a what if this is actually not cool? What's happening right now? What if there's some sort of moral worth in people being free? Again, we're simplifying significantly here. The Enlightenment was significant in that it was over its course a major turning point in how people perceived the relationship between the ruling class and the subservient class, and ideas began to flourish from Enlightenment thinkers, ideas like universal education, which, of course, was one of the founding principles of the United States of America. And that's really crazy when you think about it. I mean, to think about society is going from the idea that peasantry, they're literally like not even political agents. They're not even like worthy. They're just like, just farm your crops, dude, you know? And then you go from that to people being given like a basic education, literacy being taken as something that everybody should be able to have access to. It's honestly pretty fantastic. It was a huge, huge change. Um, you have all these old values coming into conflict with these new ones. People are like academics. Like, you know how today academics are arguing over how fast uh, America will sink into the ocean with climate change and um, how much money poor people should be paid to not starve exactly? Like, this is the discourse going on today. Back in the day, these academics were legitimately discussing the extent to which individuals had the right to determine the, their own lives. Like, that was the discourse. And this is going to surprise you. Uh, that discourse got heated from time to time, you know? Um, a lot of the monarchy, the, the monarchical rule, they didn't really like the idea of the peasantry getting super, you know, uh, uppity, basically. People got pretty mad about that. We had a couple wars and a couple of revolutions. A few people died, you know? A few people died. Yeah, basically, yeah, think of the Enlightenment era as, like, Twitter, but in real life, and all the bloodshed that would entail. You know what I'm talking about? So, among many principles that were sort of fielded during the Enlightenment, we got some that coalesced together and began to refer to what we today call liberalism. Liberalism is the global ideology today. While there are other ones, and there are different variations on liberalism, liberalism is by far, without question, without competition, the powerhouse right now in the broader political discourse. This looks a little bit like the League of Legends logo. Um, that's, well, hey, actually, I feel the same way about liberalism as I do about League of Legends. So, yeah. Taking the L. Uh, <laughs> um, let me describe liberalism to you, okay? And I, it, it honestly, 
sounds pretty good, you know, if you think about it. So liberalism is described broadly by a set of beliefs, um, which could be characterized as uh, an adherence to individual rights and values and individualism broadly of democracy, um, of free trade, um, of a, uh, uh, you know, of a removal of old autocracies. Um, and a whole lot of beliefs associated broadly with the individual's ability to practically and freely live their lives however they want. I mean, we have the First Amendment here in the States, you know, what is it, uh, you know, freedom of religion? That was a pretty novel idea, though there were many societies that were effectively practicing freedom of religion a very, very long time before Europeans came up with anything of the sort. But, hey, we caught up eventually. Um, these ideas for the most part, maybe accepting free trade, which I'll get to in a second, are pretty cool, and I agree with a lot of them. But the belief in free trade was punctuated with another set of beliefs that came to be known as, when applied, capitalism. Essentially this, and I'll speak broadly here. Before our understanding of capitalism came to be what it is today, which could also be referred to as laissez-faire capitalism, we had mercantile capitalism. Mercantile capitalism was, rather than what we have today, where anybody can start a business and anybody can make it to be a Bill Gates or whatever, Hypothet theoretically anyone can, really. I mean, today in America, it is true that hypothetically any one individual person could strike it and be incredibly wealthy and powerful, though it is a mathematical certainty that the number of people who actually do so are very, very few. Um, yeah, bootstraps and the like. But ye back in the day with mercantile capitalism, that wasn't necessarily the case. Usually businesses were either um, operated and deployed at the behest of the crown, or they worked directly with the empire to maintain the economic apparatuses that would be used for what was then colonialism, you know? That the mercantile capitalism was usually about like businesses working together with empires to extract wealth and resources from colonized territories but you couldn't it wasn't just like any random person could become like a multi-billionaire business mogul you know that free association that free right to trade it just didn't exist back then so these wonderful enlightenment thinkers they thought what economic system would best complement you know democracy what economic system would best complement democracy uh, uh education you know uh, uh, individual liberties well Surely, it would be an economic system that allows free participation in the market. It makes sense if you think about it. But there are uh, some uh, issues with that. There are tenets of liberalism that I like very much. Uh, I like the belief that individual freedom is something which should be valued. You know, Karl Marx was a great believer in freedom and democracy. Democracy, of course, being the uh, political system by which freedom expresses itself, at least certainly compared to monarchies. I mean, whatever problems our democracies have, it's a little better than a monarchy, you know. It's, it's a step up. It's a step up. Um, however slight it may feel sometimes, it is indeed a step up. Karl Marx didn't talk about equality. A lot of people say Karl Marx was this, like, equality-obsessed communist. No, 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 no. I mean, he did like communism, sure, but what he cared about most of all was freedom, not equality. He felt that equality would arise because of freedom, that the reason we didn't really have equality was because people weren't given the same types of freedom. Even if the laws apply equally to everyone, and keep in mind, during Marx's lifetime, and even today they don't, back during Marx's lifetime, America still had chattel slavery. And he wrote to Lincoln, asking Lincoln to get rid of that slavery, and then slavery was gotten rid of. Skipping a few steps here, but in short, Marx abolished slavery in the U.S. Uh, you're welcome, or thank you, actually, since I'm not Marx, but I do live in the U.S. Um, yeah, cool, right? There were different levels of freedom assigned to different people. Some people were very wealthy and powerful, and they had freedom that the poor classes did not have. What's that old quote? Both the rich and the, for both the rich and the poor, it is equally against the law to sleep beneath the bridge. You know that quote? It's a wonderful quote. It describes what sociologists like to refer to as systemic violence, which is an essential concept to understand if you want to, I guess, understand what's wrong with the world right now. Violence, the 
use of force from one agent to another, usually in return for something or to get something from them, um, is today less commonplace than it has ever been in all of human history. Ah, yes, that's the quote right there. The law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under the bridges, to beg in the street, and to steal bread. Exactly. It's a beautiful quote. It's fantastic. Now today, right now, let's say in America, we are at a record low level of violence in terms of random crimes, people dying off in war, uh, you know. Um, today is a relatively safe period of time to live in. I mean, crime rates vary, you know, year to year they jump. Right now, because of COVID, we're getting a little bit of a spike. But generally speaking, civilizationally, we are in a remarkably violence-free period of time. But what about systemic violence? See, capitalism was, and I maintain this, some people don't want to acknowledge this, some leftists, but I maintain that the concept of capitalism integrated well with what was originally thought to be the best possible sociological package to ensure human liberty. I do believe that, yeah, initially, when it was conceptualized. The idea of free trade, everyone gets to participate in the market equally, you know, the government only really sort of leans in on the borders, but they set the stage, but apart from that, you know, people duke it out and the best competitor comes out on top. Conceptually, I think that's wonderful, but there's a problem. There are actually a lot of problems, and we could talk about inequities and market failures all we want to, but the real problem, the heart of the problem, is that capitalism perpetuates the hierarchy that the Enlightenment had otherwise succeeded in advocating against. Because it is, I think, no exaggeration to say that the modern day wealthy, the, the, the very wealthy today, are a sort of modern aristocracy in the sense that they have a disproportionate amount of power over the society over which they provide, in the sense that there is a hereditary component to their power, in the sense that they often have a direct line of contact with the rulers of our society, the politicians, you know, uh, or, or people in direct positions of power. There is an aristocratic element to it. Now, it's not directly lineage-based. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not exactly the same, but the underlying tendencies remain similar. And whereas we once had, you know, barons and lords who controlled vast swaths of territories where serfs just existed on and had to provide uh, a great portion of their grain in order to continue living on that plot of land, nowadays, you know, we have a very small number of corporations that control a vast swath of smaller corporations, which themselves control hundreds of thousands and millions of jobs, which you have to work at or you get fired. And you don't starve anymore, but you certainly don't live a good life if you can't adhere yourself to the expectations of these corporations. And what I am describing right now, this um, work or starve attitude, is systemic violence. It's a kind of violence which is indirect and therefore very difficult to directly address or blame anyone for. And in many ways, that's actually the point. If a direct act of violence is committed from one person to another, it's very easy to point that out and go, stop, you're arrested. It's very direct. But what if you're in a position, let's say, um, you know, you're a you're a, a a factory worker. You know, a hundred years ago, and you're born in a series of tenements somewhere in like the slums of New York, and you don't have the money to move. In fact, you're actually in a little bit of debt because you needed food and you're not paid very much. You could get another job, but the job you currently work takes up twelve hours a day, six days a week. So, I don't know if you can get another job on top of that. I don't know how how easy the flex hours worked back then. You know what I mean? And your job doesn't really pay enough to support your family. Like, it's the family that you have. What do you do? Well, you can indebt yourself further. Your children can go into work uh, if they're old enough and contribute to the family income. In all likelihood, whatever path you take, there is going to be a monumental amount of misery in your life. But why? I mean, really, like, why? You, they didn't have to be miserable. 
I mean, the advent of the Industrial Revolution increased the productivity of humanity. It didn't decrease it. There was wealth and food and space enough to go around. It was entirely possible for everyone in that time to live a better existence than many of those you know, tenement uh, factory workers did back then. What, why is there misery when there doesn't have to be? What leads to that misery? What is the, why are there homeless people in the United States? Lord knows we have enough money and space to take care of them. If we really wanted to, we could, we could fix it very, very quickly. It's a logistical problem that our country is more than capable of handling, but it doesn't. But we continue raising the military, uh, uh, you know, uh, funding every year. Why? Why does that happen? Nobody's having a gun pointed at their head, at least not to begin with, but violence, or at least harm being committed against people because of the actions of other people, in this case, business owners, legislators, whatever, is still taking place. And eventually, the final step of that process is that the monopoly on legitimate interpersonal violence held by the state allows them to inflict actual violence on you if you transgress against social rules for long enough. If you're homeless in the wrong place at the wrong time, you could end up being arrested. If you, a hundred years ago, were in deep enough debt as a factory worker, you could be put in debtor's prison. And all of this, not because the homeless person or the factory worker was any more lackadaisical or any less intelligent than any of their compatriots, or even of their bosses, really. It's just how the dice fell when they were born. Which zip code were they born into? Which family? Were their parents wealthy? Were their parents poor? Did their mother have a drug habit? Yes or no? Did they have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism? It's not fair, is it? I believe, and this is another one of those personal beliefs of mine, axiomatic even, that we should reduce, to the greatest possible extent, systemic violence, that we should eliminate it as much as possible. That's what I believe. A lot of what I advocate for is about that belief. It's not really about equality in so much as it's about giving everyone the opportunity to succeed or fail on the best possible terms, on even terms, so we can really see who's winning. I mean, we get this in athletics, after all. All the runners start at the same line, or actually they started a tiered system of lines because of the way circumferences expand if you go further out from the center of a circle. But we get the desire for fairness. That's something we believe in. It's something we take into account when we design these things. So capitalism, at least in my opinion, doesn't succeed in its promise. It doesn't succeed in what it's supposed to do, which is to maximize human liberty. Instead, it uh, perpetuates human hierarchy, human inequality, um, to a great extent. From liberalism, we get capitalism, which is now the predominant global economic system. Pay no mind to people who accuse the Scandinavian countries, China, Russia, or whatever else of being socialist countries. They are certainly not. They may have different levels of government involvement, but no, they are all capitalist countries and they operate based on the same set of rules. But capitalism's continued existence for the past hundred years, or, well, sorry, several hundred years, not just a hundred, uh, has uh, made some people um, uh, very mad, very sad, and very mad. And people in their sadness and madness have attempted to address the problems of capitalism with their own solutions in a wide variety of ways. I want to talk about two of those ways. Socialism and fascism. Whoop. Or as the cool kids call it, socialism or barbarism. This is a belief held amongst many political radicals. It's a belief that I hold myself to this day, that there are some inconsistencies within capitalism, some internal antagonisms in a dialectical sense. You can read Hegel if you want to learn more about that. Actually, don't read Hegel, just Google dialectic. Uh, that will lead inevitably to people with different political perspectives sort of grabbing the, the steering wheel and moving society as they see fit. We have socialists, and socialists' prescriptions for the world are similar to the ones that I've described for you right now, an insistence on systemic problems, that there are systemic solutions to systemic problems, that there is an underlying current of violence behind capitalism and behind the society in which we live 
And, um, and it can be fixed. It can be fixed if we are diligent and if we distribute public resources well. Now, what this isn't is collectivism. I don't know how this term collectivism hit the public zeitgeist the way that it has, but I want to be perfectly clear, okay? Marx's ideas about society were anything but collectivist. If you want to think about collectivism, okay, if you want to identify collectivism, look at a nationalist. Look at somebody who demands children stand for the flag when the Pledge of Allegiance is sung or spoken at the beginning of every school day. Take a look at many um, religious groups, especially fundamentalist, orthodox, or evangelical religious groups. These are collectivists. These are people who have a very strong group identity, and their group identity often eclipses their individual identity. The core of socialism is deeply individualist in all of the best ways, an expression of individual rights and a repudiation of an individualist worldview. That is to say, you promote the individual, you champion the rights of the individual, the freedoms of the individual, but you don't delude yourself into believing that all the problems in the world are caused by individuals being lazy workers or individuals being dumb. No. Individual rights, systemic solutions. In my opinion, it's a really good way to look at the world. And then you've got fascism. You've... Oh, whoops. How'd we get there? If you've watched my channel for any length of time, you probably know my opinions of fascism. I mean, biases and all that. Not a huge fan myself. Fascists are... Well, it's difficult to describe fascism because fascism is idiosyncratic. That is to say, it pulls from many sources. And it's also de deliberately incoherent in the sense that if you speak to a fascist or if you ask a fascist what they believe, there's often an undercurrent of anti-intellectualism that will prevent them from being able to give you a complete view of what it is they believe. But I think Umberto Eco's essay on Ur-Fascism, which lists 14 points that describe broadly what fascists tend to be like, is the best description we have presently, in, in my opinion. If you want a really, really simple explanation, think of it as highly anti-intellectual, um, ultra-nationalism, with a slant towards xenophobia and traditional values. That's kind of the gist of it. Basically, uh, they believe that individual rights, that a promotion of individuality has led to degeneracy, that it's led to individuals being morally repugnant. Usually they think this is, I don't know, interracial marriage or gay people having sex. That tends to, I mean, that tends to be what they cite, you know, uh, as, as examples of individual degeneracy. And they believe that the solution to this is to double down on a set of very collectivist, very traditionalist hierarchical values that they believe are the core tenets of society. The family, the state, the military, masculinity. Basically, it's very hierarchical and very traditional. And in the interest of fairness, I will say this. What fascists believe at their core is usually motivated by a fear. And that fear of otherness, of alienation, of emasculation, of brown people, of being cucked, whatever, that fear usually stems from some pretty legit problems with how capitalist societies tend to organize themselves. Usually fascist movements originate from economically um, anxious times where people feel uncertain about the future of their country, and there's a prevailing narrative that somehow the people of your nation are being victimized or played for fools by something, some group, usually a racial, ethnic, or religious group, and that the best way to deal with these anxieties is to repudiate, to, to, to reject the atomization, the hyper-individualism that that group has pushed upon the people of your country, uh, that to double down on love of God, country, state, family, the white race, many of them believe that too. I don't think this is a great solution to society's problems, which is the reason why fascist governments almost always torpedo themselves and their states into a burning crater. Uh, they do a very poor job of meaningfully addressing the problems that they actually intend to solve. And while data on this is shaky, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that fascist governments historically have not really improved the material well-being of the people who live within them. It's generally speaking, you know feel like on average they're a little bit of a drain on human happiness. 
Now, I've said a lot more about fascism in the past than this. A lot more. But I'm trying to keep it a little bit simple. Most of the political discourse that you're going to see online is going to be between these three groups, or at least people who associate broadly with these three groups, okay? So when you see America First types talking about globalist and bureaucrats destroying America with immigration, that would be a fascist talking point against capitalists, okay? When you hear people talking about how, um, uh, you know, border camps are going to be uh, the beginning of the American Fourth Reich and how brown people are soon going to, uh, you know, be led up to camps, you're usually hearing arguments from socialists or from capitalists against fascists. And so on and so on. You've probably heard some iteration of arguments against all of these groups. Capitalists will tend to call socialists financially irresponsible, um, you know, politically ignorant or naive. They'll usually accuse them of being young or inexperienced, which in many cases they tend to be. Good-hearted, though, mind, at least many of you. Uh, and capitalists will usually refer to fascists... Well, it depends. Depending on how uh, wealthy that capitalist is, or no, I should speak a little more specifically. Depending on how much that capitalist would benefit from fascism, the response tends to vary. You know, there were many corporations during Nazi Germany that benefited tremendously from their close association with the Nazi party. Uh, and Hitler himself was very much in favor of the free market. He de, uh, you know, um, deregulated many of these businesses and engaged in an act of uh, privatization, that is to say, handing these businesses the keys over to private enterprise. As long as they worked closely with the state, businesses were treated very well under uh, his fascist government. But it wasn't really capitalism because it wasn't really a free market. You had to work in tandem with the state. It was more than capitalism. It was, maybe you could call it, capitalism and decay. What this looks like right here, what I'm doing right here, it looks like I'm trying to set up a political compass. You've all seen this, I assume. Or maybe subreddits built around this. We've all seen something to this effect. Well, chat's not working right now, but I imagine you have. This is called a political compass. A political compass is a way of... Uh, how would you describe it? Of mathematically, of geographically, triangulating a set of political positions, you know? What are you? Oh, I'm off-right. I'm lib-left. I'm off-left. I'm lib-right. And while there is some descriptive utility to these positions, in reality, I think that the idea of a political compass encourages a lot of laziness. It's actually a really, it's not just reductive, it's flat-out inaccurate. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense if you actually think about it for a little while. Um, for example, you know, you talk about like lib left and lib right unity or off left and off right unity or lib left off left or lib right and off right. And it feels like what, what's really happening there when you talk about stuff like this is you're memifying political discourse. You're simplifying very complicated political positions down to a set of identifiers or basic characteristics. And then you're extrapolating from them the graph around which they're built. That is to say, the political positions arrived before the graphs used to describe them. Not all political compass tests are bad. I think that eight values is generally pretty good. Um, and it has eight axes, so it actually has 16 distinct positions or directions you can move in, I believe. Um, or no, does it have four, eight? I, I forget exactly, but it is, it's, it's not the little funny man squares or anything like that. The main reason that they don't work, I think, is because there are actually three principal axes along which you should be describing political positions. So here's a question for you guys, okay? The top down means off, right? Off, left, lib, left, off, right, lib, right. So it refers to state control, I assume, where up here you would have a dictator and down here you would have an anarchist, I imagine. Okay, and then left and right, refer to uh, how much your market is, uh, 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 you know, free as opposed to controlled. So the ultra libertarians would be, um, would be over here, like, ca like capitalists, you know? And then over here you would have socialists. So if that's the case, where does political liberalization versus political radicalization happen? If the people up here are dictators, 
the people down here, anarchists, the people over here, socialists, and the people over here, capitalists, where does hating black people fit on this scale? Does that make you more of a dictator? Well, no, I mean, memes aside, there are plenty of people in this circle right here who seem to hate black people. Where does that fit exactly? Where does political or social liberalism fit in versus reactionary positions? It, it actually doesn't fit in this chart, if you think about it. You can try to squeeze it in, but it doesn't work. This chart doesn't work. And if you actually think about it, this whole scale, this spectrum, doesn't really seem to work that much at all. I mean, there are a lot of libertarian right people who, if you actually press them just a little bit, are, um, are uh, um, like, off-right. Ben Shapiro is an example. Ben Shapiro claims to be a libertarian conservative, but he wants to ban pornography, um, promote, like, religious rights and, uh, you know, uh, like, religious, um, or, like, a, you know, religious hierarchy uh, in society, and he's deeply in support of, like, authoritarian conservative control of the state. So is he a libertarian? Well, no. Well, I've met actual conservative libertarians, but they also tend to be in favor of a lot of the stuff that authoritarian conservatives engage in with regards to like welfare programs, which leads to a reduction of human equality in a way that is what exactly? I don't think that these labels work. And I think the more you think about them, the less they actually work. Another good example of this would be authoritarian leftists, like the people who tend to defend China. Now, this is a contentious position of mine, but I do sincerely believe this. I believe that many of the people who are super out to defend Russia or the USSR or China act indistinguishably from a lot of fascists, because they seem to enjoy more than anything else the military propaganda, the state power, you know, the aesthetic of the Soviet Union, strong-shouldered men with chiseled jaws staring forward as they gather grain from the collective or whatever. But these aesthetics are not egalitarian or socialist in nature. If anything, they're the opposite. The idea of sterling military authority figures represented by six foot two white guys with square jaws collecting resources from what are essentially like modern peasantry, that doesn't really gel with my understanding of socialism. If anything, it seems like a promotion of class collaborationism, which is a fascist idea. That is to say, uh, the party leaders who rule over society are actually super duper just one of you common workers, fellow USSR comrades. Thank you very much. We're actually just one of the same. Hey, don't worry about it. So are they fascists? Well, no, fascists hate the USSR. So what gives? I don't think that you can get any real descriptive value from these ideas, okay? I think there's actually just one real political compass, okay? It's super reductive but it's also, in my opinion, the one that really matters, okay? And that political compass is a line, and it's hierarchy versus equality. I have found, in my talking with people and arguing my positions and believing the things that I believe, that the most consistent, the most explanatory, the most descriptive way of describing people's political positions is whether they hinder or help human equality, human freedom, you know, whether they liberate humans or restrict them. This falls in line with a very fundamental reactionary versus politically liberal tenant, the idea that human beings should rule over others or should not. There are many people, fascists are the extreme example of this, uh, but many others do believe this as well. They believe that humans are naturally either politically um, worthy of power or not, and that societies function best when humanity is organized like a sharp pyramid, where you have people on top and people in the middle and the people on the bottom, you know. Uh, and then there are people who believe that society would be better if the pyramid was as flat as possible, if the common people, the people on the bottom, really weren't that far away from the points of power at the top. If you'll recall, the Enlightenment was all about flattening that pyramid. I mean, this was a monarchy, baby. 
how do you get more hierarchical than that? You've got divine blood or you don't. Or actually, it's like, it's, it's like this, and like the monarchy is up here, and then you have the aristocracy, and then you have the peasantry, you know? Like, yikes. But democracies don't really function like that. Leadership and democracy, I mean, technically they serve us. That's what they're supposed to do. That's their role. So they're up here, sure, but they're meant to be accountable. They're closer to us. In my mind, capitalism is inequitable in large part because the way our economy works gives an ungodly number of resources to a very small number of people on the top, and we can't even touch them. The amount of wealth inequality in America today is greater than it ever has been, and it's like near the pharaoh levels. I mean, you can imagine the Egyptian pharaohs sitting upon their crowns, of, their, their thrones of gold or whatever, and then you have all the slaves and peasants outside, and that's where we're at, basically, when it comes to wealth distribution, more so than anything else. Um, I've talked a lot about this, and this may all seem very esoteric, but these are the fundamental beliefs that I use to organize my thought process when I'm thinking politically. When I think about ideas or values, when I think about whether or not I like a thing, whether or not I like a position, whether or not I'm fond of X or Y, I always try to think of it in relation to these very basic principles. Essentially, how do I draw my beliefs and positions back to an axiomatic value that I hold, this right here, and also, how does this discourse contribute to the fundamental war between um, equality and inequality, between hierarchy and um, liberation? How, how do these relate? What's the relationship between these factors? Everything that I think of, all the political beliefs that I hold, all the policy discussions I engage in, they all come from that first and foremost. That's the bedrock of my political thinking. That's what I get it all from, you know? If you want to learn more about any of these ideas, this is going to sound really reductive, but I encourage you, unironically, go look at the Wikipedia page for an idea, and then go look at the sources that are cited at the bottom of that page. Wikipedia itself is, some people say it's always an unreliable source. That's not true. There are Wikipedia articles that are written, sometimes it almost feels like at a college level, if you're reading up something on like biology or something on like uh, genetics, as you're like reading it and you're like, oh wow, I actually don't understand anything. Like it's not written in an eighth grade, eighth grade level at all. Though there is a simple Wikipedia that you could go to if you do want to read something at an eighth grade level. Um, that's up to you. But if you really want like an, a strong engagement with these concepts, go look at what's cited in a political article, you can get a lot out of that. You can get an unbelievable out of that, or unbelievable amount out of that. It's so, so, so beneficial. If there's anything that I would advocate for more than that, if there's anything that I would actually consider to be more important than your research method, it would be something called the sociological imagination. I would ask my chat if they know what that is, if they were here to be with me. Um, the sociological imagination was the first thing that I was taught when I got my sociology, you know, uh, undergrad started. And uh, what it taught me was that it's important to stay hydrated. Can't deny it. It also taught me to be critical and to be curious when imagining why the world is the way it is. See, a lot of people tend to believe that the world is the way it is in some essentialist way. Uh, why are poor people poor? Why are, well, this is a contentious one, isn't it? Why are black people in America poorer than white people? Why do women and men tend to act differently? Why is this part of the world full of violence and this part of the world stable and secure? And often people resort to very lazy answers to those questions. In truth, there's only one answer, an answer with a million possible explanations. And that answer is that a combination of political, social, economic, religious, whatever factors led to things being the way they are. There are very few essentialist explanations in human society. This is, after all, a society. It's one that we built. It's one that we live in. We did find it in the desert. We constructed it. We built this world. There's nothing essential to it, or at least there's very little essential to it. We made this world. And because we've been around for a long time, and because developed societies have been around for a long time, 
there have been plenty of opportunities for people with different values, people with different political beliefs, people with different levels of power to interact with each other in ways that have disadvantaged some groups and advantaged others. Have a sociological imagination. Don't be lazy. Don't just think, oh, this thing is the way it is because it is. It's not helpful. It won't help you understand these problems. I can't tell you how many arguments I've had with usually conservatives uh, about, this is again a contentious one, but it's one that comes up often in my line of work, about uh, racial income gaps. You know, why do black people have so much less money? Well, slavery was like 150 years ago, and, you know, the Civil Rights Act passed 60 or so years ago, so why? You know, that's what they ask me, and it's always tough talking with them, in part because I don't think they realize how short a time 60 years is to have been a second-class citizen, but also because it feels like they're not actually asking. What they're trying to do is shift blame. There's the perception on the part of a lot of conservatives that attempts to address systemic racism are actually an attempt to fleece white people or to make them feel guilty. That left-leaning people like me are trying to make white people guilty. We're trying to impugn them for the sins that white people have committed in the past. Nothing is less interesting to me than that. Nothing. It's incredibly uninteresting to me. What I'm actually interested in, more than anything else, um, is setting up the cards, putting the pieces together in such a way as to ensure that we don't have these problems anymore. But you can't do that until you know where those pieces are, how they're arranged. And in order to know that, you need to have the imagination to think, why is there a racial income gap? What did lead to that? Was it redlining? Well, that's part of it. Was it policing? Well, that's part of it. Was it legislation? Well, that's part of it. Just think about it for a bit. Okay? Just don't be... Don't be... Lazy. Enjoy your research. Um, you would be astonished how much you can learn with 15 minutes of reading. Um, if you spend 15 minutes reading on any political, economic, or social topic, you will probably know more than enough to trounce the most intelligent uh, demagogues online on that subject. People just don't do any research anymore. It's really disgusting, honestly. Um, have fun with it. And remember, again, I'm a socialist. That informs my position. Um, socialists often refer vaguely to something they call theory. That is to say, to the written works of academics, scholars, philosophers, economists, who wrote on the issues relevant to socialists. You know, you have your Karl Marx, you have your Vladimir Lenin, you have your, you know, Bakunin, you, there's many of them, you know. And very often there's this discourse on the left, should you read theory or should you not? Well, of course you should read theory. But don't make the mistake of believing that it's fundamental to understanding these ideas. Don't gatekeep political understanding behind these, you know, these pieces of text. It's just not accurate. Uh, when Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, ye back a billion years ago, he did so because he recognized that the average European um, peasant or factory worker probably wasn't going to sit through the eight billion pages of Das Kapital that he had written in order to arrive at some understanding about how the world was boned. No, he recognized that though he wanted to extol upon them extensively in capital, the problems that people face these days really aren't so complicated that you need theory to understand them. Usually you just need a, you know, a really basic argument, a couple of basic pointers. So theory is good, but don't make the mistake of believing that you like need that theory to be an effective advocate for your political positions, okay? Though I will admit, I've gotten a lot out of reading State and Revolution and some others, so it's worth your time if you want to engage in it. Politics is important. Um, hopefully this was a good summation of the positions that I hold and um, why I believe what I believe very fundamentally and how I arrive at the positions that I believe in. Um, and I'll talk about this more in the future, certainly. At the end of the day, what is politics? Politics is about power more than anything else. It's the power to change the world. That's what it's about. And some people want to use that power for good. Again, being very reductive here. Some people want to use that power because they have a 
a dream for the world. They believe that the world could be better in some way. There could be fewer homeless people. There could be fewer poor people. There could be fewer instances of domestic abuse. There could be something, some positive change. And often the world is made better for the efforts of those people. But sometimes people only want power to benefit their own interests, uh, their own position, their own station. I think that many politicians kind of fall into that blanket. And I don't know how much you can do to change those people's minds. The group of people whose minds you can change more effectively than any other are the people who believe they're engaged in politics to improve the world, when in reality, they're engaged in politics to improve the station of another person. People who think they're doing the Lord's work, people who think they're doing good unto the world, but who are actually just parroting a set of positions given to them by a person with a different set of interests. Like the so many poor people who regurgitate conservative talking points that they were taught by millionaire radio shock jocks. Or all the people out there who, to protect the children, advocate against gay marriage, when in reality all the homophobia in society has actually led to the harm and suicide of a great many you know, young queer people. They may not even know they're doing harm. And that's the tough part, isn't it? How much of it is you having a different axiomatic belief? Usually it's not. Often it's that you don't know or you don't agree upon what is or is not good. Or sometimes you agree upon what is good. You agree upon the things that should be improved, the things that shouldn't be improved. But you don't know how to get there. I get that a lot with, um, with other lefties. Some lefties, they'll think that I'm like a liberal capitalist neolib or something because I thought that Biden was better than Trump, you know? At the end of the day, my values are the same as them. And in fact, the things that I believe are good are the same as them as well, too. I imagine many of those lefties agree with me that it's good to have less bigotry and, you know, more income equality and blah, 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 blah. But they see what I do, they see what I say, and they make a critical error. They misattribute a position that I hold for an action that I take to get there. They don't understand how A connects to B connects to C. If you become cognizant of this process, why people say what they say, why they believe what they believe, and how those beliefs tie into a set of fundamental principles, you can be very effective at changing their minds. And if you do want to change people's minds, I hope to God you want to do so in a way that improves the world and not in a way that convinces them to make the world worse because we've got enough of that.